Uh, it's, it's with great enthusiasm and joy uh, that I welcome you all to Minnesota State University Moorhead, um, which will be the host of this evening's conversation. Uh, time is now to put Minnesota children first. Before we proceed with introductions and questions, I want to recognize that MSUM acknowledges that it occupies the ancestral land of the Anishinaabe, Ojibwe, Dakota, Sisseton, Wapaton, and Yankton Dakota First Nations. We honor and celebrate our indigenous peoples that came before us and those amongst us. My name is Jared Pigeon, pronouns he, him. I serve as the campus diversity officer here at MSUM and will be today's moderator. I'm humbled to be in this role and to help us move this conversation forward for our youth across the state. This is, a personal issue. this is a personal issue to me. Identifying as a biracial male, uh, growing up in a single mother-headed household, low income, education was a struggle, as were many other things. I, am, I unfortunately stopped out of education at, after the ninth grade as things became more difficult, helping out at home and, and other challenges. I'm proud to say that I later went back and did receive my GED and have since received my master's degree and currently pursuing a doctor's degree. So I am the dream. When I look at my three children, ages 18, 13, and 11, and as I look at your children and your children, I am reminded that we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied to a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. I am also hopeful that our best days are ahead of us, that our days of inaction and failure to acknowledge the truth are behind us. I am confident if we are to achieve a collective progress as a society, we must start with our children. The time is now. This event is a third in a series that the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, the Minnesota Humanities Center, and former Minnesota Supreme Court Justice Alan Page are doing across the state of Minnesota. They will also be joined today by Dr. Anno Waseska, president of West Central Initiative Foundation for today's conversation. Each year as Minnesota grows increasingly more diverse, and this is slated to continue for many decades. At the same time our diversity is increasing, disparities in educational outcomes continue to be present not to mention that oftentimes those numbers are exacerbated, particularly in our underserved communities across the state. The conversation today is about what we need to do to serve this increasingly diverse student body and ensure that all children are included and given the tools and opportunity to reach their full potential. So without further ado, I will ask each esteemed panelist to introduce themselves. Let's go down the line. Let's go down the line. So I'm Anna Wasesha. Um, I am the president of West Central Initiative. We are a community foundation and a regional planning organization, but I'm not a complete uh, interloper into this conversation. I spent most of my career in higher education uh, and uh, much of it uh, at uh, the community colleges, both in Minnesota and in Connecticut. Uh, and so these issues are incredibly important to me because uh, colleges are the, the recipients of the graduates of our K-12 system. And uh, in the community college system, you see uh, some of the consequences of not working to uh, make sure that every student is educated by the time they leave high school and uh, not addressing the, all the issues, the wraparound issues. So I'm really grateful to have a chance to be in this conversation with my esteemed colleagues. My name is Alan Page. I'm a former Associate Justice of the Minnesota Supreme Court. 
Um, I come to this conversation as a result of parents who knew and understood the value of education, having spent the last, myself having spent the last 50 plus years spending time in schools and classrooms with young children talking about that importance and that value. I'm also a product of a generation that, uh, when I came into the world, was a world, and we lived in a country where segregation was state-sponsored. And I happened to be around when the United States Supreme Court, I was eight years old when the United States Supreme Court decided Brown versus the Board of Education. That sounded the death knell of state-sponsored segregation. Didn't fix the education problems. And I don't blame that on Brown. I blame that on us, those of us who have created the ed education system and allowed it to go on in the manner and the way it has. And for me, education is important that we educate all children because it's an issue of justice, it's an issue of fairness, and as Jared noted, my children and grandchildren are inextric inextricably linked to your children and grandchildren and vice versa. And to the extent that we leave any child behind, we leave ourselves behind. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Jared, for hosting this conversation. We're delighted to be here with all of you this evening. My name is Aline Churamoff, and I'm the Senior Vice President of Community Development at the Minneapolis Fed. I also have the pleasure of leading our Center for Indian Country Development, and that means that we lead a team of applied researchers and policy practitioners who are focused on policy issues that are impacting our community in the 9th District. And so for the Minneapolis Fed, the 9th District is you know, Montana, North and South Dakota, uh, Minnesota, Northwest Wisconsin, and the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. So it's a pretty broad swath of, of, um, of the country, but also really trying to recognize what's happening in communities across the state and what's happening in, in communities even just in our own backyard here in Minnesota. And that's one of the reasons why we came to focus on education as we start to look at the, the disparities in outcomes that you see across the state and as our our state becomes increasingly diverse. If we continue to leave students behind, whether or not it's racial or ethnically uh, based um, outcomes, differences in outcomes, or if it's rural urban, or kind of rich or poor, it doesn't really matter if it's across the state. And ultimately, as Justice was just noting, if we leave people behind, that's a missed opportunity from an economic standpoint. It's a drag not only on them individually and their families, but also on the vibrancy of the economy of our entire state. So it's one of the reasons why the Minneapolis Fed is so deeply engaged in education because we see it as um, the future prosperity and really trying to understand how that, how, how those pieces kind of come together. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kevin Lindsay, and I'm the CEO of the Minnesota Humanities Center. Appreciate uh, being invited here to be part of this panel conversation and participating with the Fed and with Justice Page to bring forward this timely and very important conversation about education. The Minnesota Humanities Center, you know, I, I can almost take you out on the road. We talk about a just society that's curious, connected, and compassionate curiosity that we come to conversations with open hearts and open minds. And then on the connected part, I use that same quote by Dr. King, that we see ourselves now together in a garment of mutual destiny and compassionate, that we're motivated beyond empathy toward action. Uh, the Minnesota Humanities Center, we do a lot within K-12 schools, but we do a fair amount with colleges as well. So this is a very important conversation for us as an institution. And then prior to taking on this position as the CEO of the Minnesota Humanities Center, I had the pleasure of serving in Governor Dayton's cabinet as a commissioner of human rights uh, with my good friend uh, Elaine here. Uh, and in that work at the Department of Human Rights, we took a look at um, suspension disparity. Um, so for me, this is uh, important work, and in that work, just to give two facts for folks, just to kind of ground the disparities that we're talking about. Nationwide, it's shameful that African American males are suspended at a rate three times that of somebody who's white, not of Hispanic origin, 
In the state of Minnesota, though, we suspend male students at eight times the rate. And then when we talk about our indigenous brothers and sisters, again, it's shameful that the national average is that indigenous child is five times more likely uh, to be suspended than a white child that is not of Hispanic origin. In the state of Minnesota, it's 10 times. So uh, we have a lot to celebrate within Minnesota, but we've got a lot of work to do, and specifically within this area. So I'm so grateful for the leadership that Justice Page is showing here in the Federal Reserve and our good friends within the foundation world to bring forward this conversation. Now is the time to put children first. Thank you. I've prepared some questions to get us started, and we'll take some audience questions from those here and also those virtually. Uh, so please uh, keep them handy. And if we don't get to all of them, we would still like for them to be included and submitted. So the first question will be for you, Justice Page, and then we'll give each other panelists an opportunity to answer. Currently, we see many state legislators introducing bills to ban concepts teaching critical inquiry into our P-20 education system, especially if examined through a racial lens. What is your thoughts on that, Justice Page? Well, my, my, my initial thought is banning the con the, 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 the the idea of exploring information. I mean, we learn by exploring information. We don't learn by hiding it. And I think that some of how we got to where we are today is because we have provided limited information to children in classrooms. We have, we have failed to explore the full breadth and depth of our past. And um, it strikes me that until we do that, we will not make progress. Yeah, I really appreciate the way that Justice put that forward. The first part of, of ed education is really to be challenged with respect to ideas. So why should there ever be a initial starting point that there are some things that shouldn't be explored or shouldn't be discussed? And I'm reminded of uh, a quote by James Baldwin, uh, not, everything that can, uh, not everything can be changed, but only those things that can be changed when they're faced. So for us, I'm paraphrasing that. So within that space, we have to be able to face our history. And the fact of this matter is the genesis of this country, the original sin, is slavery. So until we have an honest, authentic conversation on that, we're, we're stuck. So we need to actually embrace having this conversation. And within this, just because we're having this conversation does not necessarily mean that people are evil. And I think what is unfortunately getting lost within a lot of the media coverage here is just simply raising the conversation of our history means that we're denigrating certain students in the classroom. Far from it. That's not really what's going on within classrooms. And I think we just, we need to really embrace sort of the ideals uh, of freedom of education, freedom of thought, and authentically living into the idea of preparing the next generation to go beyond where we have been. I mean, we're preparing it for our future generation. You know, if I could jump in here too, I think about this from the, the Fed's perspective, if that's, sorry, if that's helpful, sorry, Chris, um, of really re understanding our responsibility that was given to us by Congress, and that is our dual, what we call our dual mandate, where we're trying to manage between um, maximum employment and stable prices. And I know that stable prices have been in the news a lot lately. But when, when we have an understanding of the maximum employment side of our dual mandate, and that is as many people as possible participating in our economy. And if we don't have an understanding, a historical understanding of potential systemic barriers to full participation in our economy, and that starts in education, it starts in housing, and, other, and there's so many other factors that feed into that, 
if we don't have that full understanding that it's almost impossible for us to meet our maximum employment mandate. And so I think it's really important as, that we start at a young age of being able to really fully explore a historical context in order to have a good understanding of what's happening around us. Well, um, there are so many ways to take a bite at this apple, so I'll just take, <laughs> take a couple of them. Uh, one is that, um, and many of you are in, in, involved in the college community here, and those of you who are on Zoom may well be as, as well. There's something really incredibly important about disciplined thinking, and schools are the most efficient way to learn those rules. And so we have things like um, footnotes and jury journals and uh, logical sequence of thought. The law is a discipline. That's why we call them disciplines. And and we have, I think we have, it's at our great peril that we might talk about not teaching the skills of critical thinking in order to try to uh, keep people from understanding whatever it is that they might want to understand. Evolution, for example, which was certainly something that tore our country apart for uh, decades on decades. But the, uh, the other piece of it that I think is really, um, I, I suppose it gives me a certain amount of hope is the idea that um, people will only read books and only learn skills in schools. They will learn them elsewhere. This is not the only place where you know, people are exposed to ideas. Uh, but it, but it, can go, you know, it can go awry. And that's, that's why it's so important for educators, I think, to, to claim that space. That, that is the most important. If I were to rank the skills that somebody can learn in formal education, Critical thinking would be number one, you know, so, yeah. Can I, can I just add, you know, it strikes me that when it comes to whatever the subject matter may be, you can't learn if you don't know the facts. And to create an education system that avoids the facts, it seems to me is a real danger. Now, I, th I suppose the concern is that what opinions get caught up in those facts. But people can make their own opinion. But the facts are what they are. They don't change. And so, an education system that either alters the facts or hides the facts or fails to identify the facts in order to prevent people from making their own Inclusion, I think, is a real danger. And, and, you know, I may or may not like the facts in a given case. In fact, there will be times when I don't like the facts. But they are what they are. We don't get to choose them. We don't get to have our own facts. And some of what's going on, I think, is an effort to have our own facts. We can, we can have our own opinions, and we can have robust conversations about those opinions, but we don't get our own facts. Thank you for that. Uh, qu question two, just building right off of that. Um, as we look at some of these disparities, and Kevin, you just highlighted many of them in, in education um, in Minnesota, unfortunately leading, leading the way in these disparities. Um, people these days are looking for strategies. They're looking for things to do. They're looking for what can I do to make a difference? So that's our next question. What are some of the strategies? And I'll start with you, Kevin, since you had mentioned some of those uh, statistics. What are some of those strategies to change this current trajectory that Minnesota finds itself on? And just so I understand the 
the breadth of the question. Are you limiting that to education, or are you talking about across the board with our disparities? So I would say the very first thing that we have to do in order to effectively address the disparities which face um, our state and, and our country, really, is that we have to have an honest conversation going back and echoing what the justice was saying here about the facts and then being willing to uh, deal with and address. So those suspension statistics that I gave one of the things was most telling when we sat down with superintendents and then looked at these suspension data, and it was data that was provided by the school district to the Department of Education. The Department of Human Rights grabbed that data, so it's data from the respective schools. Students were being suspended not for engaging in violent behavior, not for brandishing a weapon, not for uh, having illegal substances on them, the most common reason why a student was being suspended is because of an interaction with an adult in the building that didn't come out well with any interaction. So you listed your children. Uh, my children started 20 to go to 26. Um, so I will tell you, having had some teenagers in, in the household, is that sometimes you have difference of opinion with your, your high school students, right? But do you suspend the child? And again, if 30%, a little less than 30%, the high 20% are just on those kind of interactions. We were suspending kids for failing to attend class at 4 or 5% of representative all suspension. So when faced with that, the schools were like, well, that's somebody else's fault, or that's somebody else's problem. Well, no, it's your problem. W what are you going to do differently? And I think too often across the disparities that we face as a nation and as a state, it's someone else's problem. It's not our problem. And we don't look to see what we can do. So if we're going to have this honest conversation, I think we all have to look at systemically at how decisions are made, how they get resolved, who follows up. If we were running a business we wouldn't, and we wanted to be successful in our business, you know, this idea of constantly improving, we wouldn't allow these disparities to exist before this community or for some several communities within our country, we allow these disparities to exist year after year after year. And we can't do it anymore. We just cannot do it anymore. We graduate more students that identify as people of color. That was several years ago. So who are going to inherit these jobs? Who are going to uh, lead in government. Who are those individuals? Those are the children that, unfortunately, we are not caring enough about to make sure those disparities don't negatively impact them. So, you know, one of the things that I think about, and I used to do a lot of work in construction, and so this maybe is like a little bit of a construction uh, analogy, but when you're building something and you see that there's an issue above grade or above ground, you have to go back to the foundation and make sure that the foundation is secure and that it's sound. And I think one of the things that we think about, especially when we're talking about education and disparities in outcomes in education, is that the foundation of the way we've built our education system in Minnesota is in our constitution. And that it is built on a, a system and a premise of adequacy of, of, of inputs and not outputs and not outcomes, especially for students. And so really when we want to think about things that are transformative and things that, will, that we think will ultimately uh, shape the future outcomes, we have to go back to the beginning and have to go back to the foundation. And so that's why um, you know, our President Kashkari and Justice Page, the Minneapolis Fed, have done all of this research to understand what outcomes are in other states, to understand that you know, other states have poverty, other states have families who are struggling, other states have the same kind of diversity, if not more, or if not greater than our own state and our own region. And they have outcomes for students of color and poor students and students across their state that are better than ours. And why is that? And so, you know, so it's, it's really important for us to think about some of the root causes when I think that that's right on. You have to think about the systemic nature of something like our education system and go back to understand that we're not 
we're not unique in providing education across the United States. All 50 states do it, right? It's not a federally required thing, but it's uh, mandated at the state level. So why is it that ours isn't working the same way that other states have been able to overcome some of those same obstacles? Um, and really, our belief is that it starts with the Constitution. It starts with the Constitution as a statement of our values, of our values that we believe that all children deserve a right to quality public education that will enable them to really fully participate and, as the words say, our economy, our democracy, and society. And so that would be how I would answer this question. Well, I will just sort of raise a point that I find odd. Kevin just mentioned the suspension rates for failure of attendance. You have a child who doesn't show up in school, and so what do you do? You don't let them come to school. There is a problem with that. There is something fundamentally wrong with a process that would result in that happening. I mean, it's, it's a little like, what's the story of Br'er Rabbit? Don't throw me in the briar patch. I mean, isn't, isn't that what we're doing with those children? I mean, that's craziness. But, you know, at the end of the day, we have to develop a system, particularly in the context of education, that educates individual children and the children who show up in the classroom, not the children we would like to have show up in the classroom. And so um, one of the reasons, or the, the, the reason that uh, President Kashkari and I have been on this journey is to make sure that, or do what we could to make sure that all children, and by all I mean all, black, brown, indigenous, able-bodied, disabled, wealthy, poor, rural, urban, all children, and anybody I missed in that list, all children have a civil right to an education that will allow them to achieve their highest potential. Now, there is some, the devil is in some of the details of how that gets done, but where we are today, we're stuck with a system that is focused on the system. Children have a right to a, an adequate education system in our Constitution. An adequate system doesn't care where you fall in within that system as long as the system is adequate. Adult considerations, but we're not educating a system, we're educating children. And so our hope is to shift the focus so that children become the priority. And I think when that happens, we create a catalyst for real change. Particularly when that catalyst um, is focused in terms of what public education is, what it's trying to accomplish, how it's held accountable, what level of priority is it, and providing remedy so that when the right isn't being fulfilled, people have a place to go. And so that their voices will be heard in ways that aren't heard today. So I just want to reinforce some of what you were just saying about, um, first of all, um, I had a wonderful professor at the University of Minnesota, Twin Cities, named Bob Beck. He was a Regents professor. And he, at least in every lecture that he gave, would say, please do not mistake being schooled with being educated. 
And wh that's what you're talking about. We have a constitutional paradigm that says we just want them in school. And we want them there for until they're 16. And, and then set them free or kick them out or whatever, you know. And, and, th and what this goes to is that what I, I was talking earlier today um, with this group of panelists and with people in Fergus Falls about the 1948 Truman Commission on Higher Education and Democracy. And one of, there were some very revolutionary things in, in that report and in the recommendations that followed, including two years of free community college, which for 70 years on, and it hasn't happened. But one of the really important pieces is that because uh, of the uh, war and the, the drafting of all the eligible people, including women and including African Americans and others, uh, Japanese, Native American, many, many people uh, were in the armed services. They were all tested. They, were, they started like building that whole test and measurements system that we now rely on so heavily. And what they determined was that most of the people that they were taking into the armed services were capable of education beyond high school, that they could benefit. That's where the concept of ability to benefit comes from. Uh, community colleges use that when people don't come to the front door of the institution and present a GED, right, or a high school diploma, but if they have the ability to benefit. Uh, and that is a huge paradigm change. And it, we're seven years on and we haven't, it still hasn't filtered through to our consciousness, right? Because so much of education is failing. It, it, it not, uh, in the sense that I mean that you are sifting the people who can get A's and B's and C's from the people who are hanging on at D's and the failers. And, and instead, what we need to be thinking about is how we can lift everybody up. And it really does come to individualizing education. But we haven't shifted our, our view because we still think that some people will fail. And, and, and in fact, you know, there was a prevailing feeling in higher education that it was the job of professors to sift the ones who could really contribute to society from those who couldn't, who couldn't cut it, couldn't make it. Um, and so, you know, you think about, that was 1948 when that came out after World War II. The Civil Rights Movement in the 60s, where we began to have some really positive change because I think the GI Bill, which came out of that report, uh, which paid for, helped people borrow money to buy homes, have the roof over their head, go to college, grow in their ability to earn a, a better income, get into the middle class, that, that there was a, a really a strong sentiment that government was giving people something for what the service they had provided. And it was natural to want to give back. And you have in the, among those um, World War II veterans uh, a great sense of volunteerism, right? So it became a, a society that was generative and generous, and then, and then we got back into our old frame of mind and, uh, and have, have allowed, as you said, schools to fail. We know the ones that, where they're failing in, in really significant ways. And it's just the way it goes, right? So we need to change the way we see the world, which gets to critical thinking and the importance of having a strong philosophy about it. Yeah. And, and I think this is what's so perilous about the particular time that we're in. So talking about the report in 1948, there was a big baby boom right, just before that. And again, I said this, but I, I want to share and sort of underscore this point. I came to Minnesota in 1991. So in 1991, less than 10% of the entire workforce, our entire population in the United States was over the age of 65, less than 10%. No child that's currently in kindergarten today in the United States will ever know a United States and their children's children will never know a United States, and their grandchildren will never know a United States, that one in five individuals won't be over the age of 65 in the United States. So that means that the labor force has dramatically shrunk, and it will stay that way. So the question then becomes, of those remaining individuals graduating into these positions, how does society respond and educate those potential new workers, new uh, leaders within government, and to the extent that we don't do that well, then we're going to take a step back as it relates from an economic standpoint. Now, one thing for Minnesota, if you take a look at the top 20 uh, largest metropolitan areas, uh, thanks to our good friends at the Fed, <laughs> Minnesota historically has been a geographic region that has outperformed 
the size of its population. So the Twin Cities metropolitan area, but you could say this for the state, I think, as well as some other sized states, but the Twin Cities metropolitan area is the 16th largest by population, but from a gross domestic product standpoint, it's the 13th most affected. So question, how do we take that secret sauce, those ingredients, and then apply them to the students that are currently within the education system and move that forward? And that's a recipe that if we win that, then we, we may have a, a bountiful dividend beyond just sort of what we have historically had. So that's why this conversation is so critically important at this point in time. Thank you. And building off of that, Aline, I'm going to start with you for this next question here is, is um, how do we work across differences in our personal philosophies towards shared educational goals for our youth? I really think it starts with the foundation of our values, and it's kind of a statement of our values. And I think that if you look across, I'm a relatively new Minnesotan. I've only been in the state for about nine years. But my experience and my uh, understanding of Minnesotans is that we care about each other, we care about our neighbors, we care about how people are doing. So not only our own children, but our neighbors' children and people around us. And so I, I really do think that if we start with a statement and assertion of those values that are common among us. We care about each other. We want people to be okay. We want people to do well and to be safe um, and to have economic opportunities. We start there, and I think that the conversation becomes much easier when we know we have the kind of same North Star, so to speak. Well, I would just point out that, you know, the way we tend to think about these things is this is the problem of the other. Well, the reality is that when you look at the disparities in Minnesota, it's all of us. And so, you know, not to be crass, but one thing we can do is look at our own self-interest. Mm. Because all these children we're leaving behind, they're responsible for our social security. But we have a self-interest in fixing these problems. Put aside the moral question. There are sound economic reasons that impact all of us, that require us to be serious about what's going on. I mean, the reality is that every child that gets left behind, this includes rural children, urban children, all children, every child that gets left behind is a diminished consumer, a diminished employee, a diminished taxpayer, a di diminished contributor to our community, and has an increased likelihood of becoming a burden on our society. So it's, it's, it's in our self-interest to fix this. And it's not the other, because all of us, at some level, sit at the level or in the position of the other. I, I would add one thing to what Justice Spade just said. It, instead of thinking of zero sum, think of this as additive. And in the area of human rights, what we sometimes would refer to as sort of curb cuts. So you come to the end of the sidewalk, the curb is then cut down. So that was largely advanced to serve individuals with disabilities. But then we found that people who were pushing strollers benefited from that. 
And then we found that folks that like to jog benefited from that. So these solutions apply broadly. And I think too often we have a mindset that if I'm trying to help this child, it's only for this child. And failing to recognize that these learnings that benefit this child are going to help that child, this child, and other children. We've got to change that mentality. And, and in the context of education, the fact that I gain doesn't mean that you lose. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just doesn't mean that you lose. It means that we both gain and that we all get better. My winning doesn't mean that you lose. Mm -hmm. my, my winning means that we all win. And can I, can I just add to that because you're so right. And also, you can't really take education away from somebody. So it's like one of the best assets that you can build. Um, but another piece is, uh, in addition to the workforce and economic development and all the other things, there's the life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness piece that uh, education helps people understand how to make choices in their lives. And uh, we were talking earlier about how when you have teenagers in your house, sometimes you have conflict. <laughs> there are so many incredibly challenging things that we do outside of earning income. Like be a neighbor, right? Live next door to somebody. Live above or below someone in an apartment building. Park next to somebody. Have a coworker who's having, you know, who's in turmoil in some way, shape, or form. Like, we have to make really smart, like, emotional intelligence decisions and curiosity, compassion. And those are skills that, that do align with having had the experience of, of uh, having your mind open to the way the rest of the world, you know, how a character in a novel has dealt with that kind of drama, how uh, somebody who is making decisions about the rules and laws of economics has decided that the, the world should be framed. I mean, it, it exposes you to ways to think about it so you can solve problems like at work, but also at home. And, uh, and as we clearly become more and more concerned and aware of climate change, we all have to become like ecological uh, thinkers and actors as well. And that will require really high level skills uh, in order to make sure that our children have grandchildren to take care of generations from now. So uh, it's all the more important, and you can't take that away from somebody. You, you just, but you can build on it. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll keep it right here for this last question that I have. I'm going to keep it right here for this last question that I have, and then we're going to take some questions from the audience, and if there's some coming in online. Um, today, we're here at Minnesota State University, Moorhead a university that was designed as a teaching college. And, and we have our Dean of Education also in the building here today. And many of our aud audience members and members here are, are educators, are connected to the system of education. So what role does education and educators play in addressing these inequities that currently exist in our communities? And I'm going to start here with you. Well, it's a huge role, but I can only take a little piece of it. So, I mean, I think that so much of the richness of life, what makes us happy and able to be productive workers and healthy human beings, is around being able to form strong, trusting relationships. And if there's anything that is the, the mark of a good, effective teacher, it's somebody who builds strong relationships with students. You have to trust somebody because you're bringing the, the student is being brought into new territory. And, and it's terra cognita. They don't know what you're, what you're pulling them into, and they have to believe that you have their best interest at heart. So I think teachers, uh, you know, in addition to methods and course design and class outlines and all the other things, it's that human relationship and that bonding uh, with people who have had different life experiences than you. But their brains are all ready to learn, and it's a huge opportunity to help them do that. Well, can I just point out that today our education system, the foundation of it, the constitutional foundation, is grounded in 1857. Slavery, 1857 existed. Dred Scott was decided in 1857. 
That's the foundation. And we have educators here. You know, we look back and think about how we've come from 1857, a world which doesn't exist today. But that's the foundation upon which we are built. And from a legal standpoint, we tend to um, ground our decisions based on the intent of our founders and the founding language. Educators today have the opportunity to be part of the founding fathers and mothers of the future, to design a system, the whatever it may look like, the ideal system, we can do that if we so choose. I, to me, that's an exciting prospect that we can start from the ground up if we so choose. And the system that we have developed over time, again, 1857, systematically and systemically leaves children behind. We have the power to change that. The question is, do we have the will? And if not now, when? You know, I, I want to go back to this idea or this point about economic exclusion, or really um, people not having the full opportunity to realize their potential. And I think that part of that starts with what educational opportunities they've had and the and what they can that ultimately translates into job opportunities. There's so many jobs today that still require a bachelor's degree or still require a master's degree. You know, some people are shifting towards more skills based hiring, but really that's a requiring that kind of a degree pedigree, a bachelor's degree, master's degree or beyond kind of amplifies missed opportunities for people if they didn't have the educational foundation to begin with. And so I, I think when Justice was talking earlier about a diminished taxpayer, a diminished participant in our society, a diminished participant in our democracy, I think we have the responsibility. It's not just somebody else's problem, it's all of our problem. It's all of our problem from an economic standpoint because of the drag that will, it will ultimately impose on the economic prosperity of the overall state as well as the country. And so I think it's it's absolutely critical to think of education as that foundational, that found building block. And I think about that in my own family as a child of, of immigrants who came to the United States as displaced people after the Second World War, that the educational opportunities that we were afforded were have been transformational over my generation, or my dad's generation, mine, and then ultimately to my kids today. Um, and so I think that the fact that we leave people behind and that we continue to leave people behind and and not act like the platform is on fire, it is on fire. And there are children today, and we have statistics that are 70% of black children can't read, can't read at the fourth grade level. 70%. It's not like we're failing half of them, we're failing more than half. And so I, I, I think that I can't echo your words more and you say them more eloquently than I ever could. But if not now, when? So the National Endowment for the Humanities was created a little more than 50 years ago. And one of the rationales given for establishing the National Endowment for the Humanities is this line, democracy demands the wisdom of its citizens. Democracy demands the wisdom of its citizens. So if we are not educating our citizens, we put our democracy at risk, period, full stop. So that's why this is so critically important for this conversation. Um, the statistic you just mentioned, um, the mayor of New York City was talking about the challenges of students <laughs> within that city. And the host of problems that the city faced, they can't be solved. We can't even start to approach them. 
until we take care of the very first thing, is making sure that every child, every child, is educated and can be a fully a full fledged participant in this democracy. Well, thank you. Uh, those were all we had for the prepared remarks, and so at this time uh, we're going to open the floor up for questions. Just raise your hand. Our two colleagues here will deliver you a microphone. If you could just introduce yourself. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm, I'm Ernest Lamb. I'm the Dean of the College of Arts and Humanities here at MSUM. And I have a comment and, and, and then a question. Uh, I'm, I'm really the third generation away from slavery. And I mention that because sometimes we think that the past and that part of our country was so far behind. When I think about my father being the second generation, growing up in Arkansas, where at the time there was only one high school for African Americans, and he grew up on the farm, and he was 20 years old before he had to work his way, working as a chauffeur in someone's home to pay his way through high school. And then the war came along, he was part of the greatest generation, worked in the segregated army, and then afterwards, because of the GI Bill, was able to go and get a college education. And he and his brothers went to Tuskegee. And I say all of that is that sometimes we forget about the transformative power of education and how that really transformed lives and how it really transformed the lives of my family. So I'm here today as not as a first generation, but really the second generation of someone who's had college education. And most of my relatives went to school. We grew up in the shadow of Central High School. And so I'm being able to go to school anywhere and not just segregated meant a lot to us, my family. And we went, and most of my relatives got became teachers. And I was a public school teacher before I started my work at uh, higher education. And so my question is part of that, is coming from a family of educators, is that part of what I'm seeing now is that somehow being a teacher, being an educator, being educated has somehow been denigrated in our country. And so part of I think if we want to really help students in the, in the primary grades is that, you know, getting appropriate teachers in and giving them the support that they need to teach, that they should not happen to be buying their own supplies, each student, that we need more teachers of color. And how can we begin to get those students interested while they're in public school to say, you know what, I want to be a teacher too. And I think there's some work there that we need to uplift for our, our teachers and the profession of education. That is, that is, I think, where we can begin to start. And I just wonder your opinion on how we may begin to kind of restore the dignity. So I re really appreciate the, the question. Um, so there's a couple of things which, is go which are going on currently within the state. So this last legislative session, there were a small pot of money made available for school districts to support what they refer to as grow your own programs to expand recruiting uh, opportunities. The amount that was appropriated was $6.5 million. Um, I leave it to the audience of, of whether that's a sufficient number. Uh, there were a lot more applications asking for uh, several multiples of that money. That I do know. Um, the school uh, and college that is primarily driving that uh, is Metropolitan State. And I've had some good conversations with Paul Spees, the professor that's leading that respective effort. And I know that Paul is very interested in leveraging what is going on in that space all throughout the state. So I think that that's one opportunity within that space. 
I know the state has made some money available through the Pelsby program. That's on the retention element. Again, a very small uh, amount of money has been set aside within that area. That's potentially an opportunity to grow some opportunities for retention. We seek to support both of those efforts at the Minnesota Humanities Center. We have educator institutes that facilitate professional development and also recruiting and retention efforts within schools. But there's a lot more uh, that could be done here. And you're absolutely right. When we talk about the importance of education playing a role within democracy, we would never think of a police officer or a fire, off, you know, a fire person uh, having to get their own supplies. Um, but we do that as it relates to teachers. Uh, we need to change that respective mindset. Well, let's be clear. Teachers are not the enemy. Let's just be clear about that. And we have to stop treating them like they're the enemy. In terms of, you know, you, you mentioned increasing the number of teachers of color. Well, one thing we have to do is help children understand that if they're going to be an increase in the number of teachers of color, they are going to have to be those teachers. They're not going to come from someplace else. They're not just going to you know, sort of drop down out of the sky that the students in our schools today have to be prepared to be those teachers. And then finally, something uh, I should mention, in introducing myself, I failed to mention that in 1988, my wife Diane and I started the Page Education Foundation that provides financial assistance to young men and women of color across the state of Minnesota for post-secondary education. We require our grant recipients, we call them Page Scholars, we require them to serve young children specifically in the area of education as tutors, mentors, and role models. And one of the things that we've discovered is that those children, that those, those scholars of ours who are required to do service, a disproportionate number of them have gone on to become teachers. I was trying to make sense of that because it wasn't something planned. But their experience serving children opened their eyes to an opportunity which they hadn't considered. I was at, um, I can't remember the name of the school in Maplewood, just before the pandemic uh, started. And I was reading to a to, I think it was all the fifth and sixth graders. And it turns out that that school had two former paid scholars on staff and another one who was doing his student teaching work. Not something planned, but something that because those young people, A, had the opportunity to go to school beyond high school. B, were required to serve young children, could see themselves in the classroom and ended up in the classroom. So there are lots of things we can do. We just have to be creative and um, focus on making those things happen. Oh, that's a, a great question. I was actually thinking about it more personally. My mom was a, an educator. She was a teacher until she became a school principal, an elementary school principal, before she retired. And I, what you were saying about kind of denigrating the profession and, and kind of lack of respect resonated with me that I think that's a hundred percent true um, and that it's a cultural thing and how do we how do we say that 
it's actually something people who are in those roles are providing a really important service to our children. And um, I think a lot of people, myself included, had a lot more insight over the last two years or year and a half in the pandemic and what happens in classrooms because we were in our, I was in my kindergartner's <laughs> Zoom classroom every day um, and trying to see what what the teacher was trying to accomplish on Zoom with a bunch of six and seven year olds, which is almost impossible. Um, and so I think culturally, there's a component that it really does feel like, how do we reinvigorate the respect that our teachers and our educators deserve um, for the work that they do, especially given the responsibility that they have um, with our future generation. I mean, I think in the banks, I would say, are like any other institution. And this is what we were saying earlier, that it's not somebody else's problem. It's all of our problem. When we say our, it's me, you, us. It's all of us together. It's, we have a responsibility to understand what's happening in these core systems in education and, and all the different things that are happening in our society and have an opportunity to kind of weigh in and think about what do we do about it. So I really appreciate all of the people who are here live, but also watching online to want to engage in a conversation about what do we do about how do we put our children first and how do we move forward together. So thank you. So it looks like we have time for, looks like we have time for one more question. I don't know if we have something online, uh, something from the audience. Uh, or if not, do we have something in the, in the gallery? Architects. Good evening. I'm uh, Provost, the Senior Vice President here at MHM, and I'm interested in the title, and I'm interested in the conversation. Here, the uh, foundation value, all those, I think many of those things we have already uh, talked about over the century. I think when COVID happened, society, we missed the opportunity to really do something. Our kids can't read. Our kids are struggling with math. Kids are stuck struggling with critical thinking. Should have taken the time in a lot of places to come back. Instead, we let the void exist so that things such as do we teach critical race? Do we wear our mask? I remember that always reminds me of tried to decide whether we should even wash our hands before we perform surgery. Hey, we good thing. No one would ever say, let's but I think that window happened, everybody grabbed for the things that things that were familiar are the very thing of systematic racism we talk about now. Even if we trained all the teachers, had more teachers of color in the classroom, if they're going to same curriculum, get us the same result, then a lot of that is dwindled. That is the true outcome of racism. But anyone in that, they will make the same decisions, same ideas, even though they're failing. So I know we don't have a lot of time, but as I think about it, what are some of the more concrete things that we can do? There are many successes, as you pointed out, that's great. The mentorship led to more, but those teachers are going to do something. I guess my question was concrete. Well, you, you, you make one really good point. That being that when all is said and done, more gets said than anything being done. President Kashkari and I, um, we have embarked on amending the Minnesota Constitution to give children a civil right to a quality public education. We think that that can be the catalyst for real change because it comes with a carrot, it also comes with a stick. A stick we don't have today. 
a stick that will result in a child whose civil right to a quality public education isn't being met having a place to go to get that right vindicated. We think that that can be a catalyst for real change. That it will, first of all, break us out of this current system, but also force us to create a system that, edu that actually educates individual children. And I think by educating individual children, we can break the cycle. And I realize that, you know, there are some challenges in getting there. But if we continue to do what we've been doing for the last hundred and however many years, we will continue to get the same results. So you started out within your question talking about the, the curriculum being the same. So there, there's a conversation out there and some of the work that the Minnesota Humanities Center has been doing for a while, sometimes referred to as absent narrative. So this work um, is amplifying, raising voices that don't, don't always appear within the textbooks within our country. So for this audience, um, just you don't have to shout it out loud, but I just want you to think of it. Uh, what are the three individuals who identify as Latino or Latina that you learned about in K-12 education? The three Latinos and Latinas that you learned about in education. So this is a question which was raised by Julian Castro, the former HUD secretary, talking about the, the, the lack of diversity of different perspectives. So going back to what Justice said earlier, the foundational aspect of ed a strong educational system and someone who is highly educated is to be able to be challenged from a, a variety of different perspectives. So just being able to expand uh, the story the information, the history from different cultures could have a significant impact. And I think we're starting to make that, and you're starting to see that within the conversation with the social studies standards. And then I think other efforts with sort of the History Society, and Vanity Society, and other organizations amplifying that up. Another concrete thing which we have found on the ground, and again, this is meeting the child and seeing them in their whole totality, is that we have facilitated what we refer to as story circles with respect to school districts. So again, every adult impacts that particular child's success. Having those story circles, having all the adults that could impact the child meet with the parents as well to see how they can utilize their respective resources to meet the child where they are. We've done some of it, I don't know, and again, I don't want to suggest that it never happens with any, without any success. It just doesn't happen often enough, and we need to you know, do more within that. And then that gets us back to finances and then the stated commitment. So this is not a binary issue. It's not just this and then this will happen. There are multiple things that we all will have to do. Hello? Oh, sure. Um, so you're asking for some suggestions for sort of things, concrete things you can do, you know. So I think one of the things that's really important is, um, is at any age, uh, uh, Justice Page is reading to children in the third grade in the Pelican Rapids schools today, and at some point, maybe you asked, somebody said, what do you, what do you want to be when you grow up? And the child said, an engineer. Um, th there are um, an infinite number of ways that people can find fulfillment in their life and still earn an income. And I think so many people are discouraged by the mainstream culture that focuses very, very heavily on how much money you can make with which degree. Uh, and so we discourage people from finding their true path because we equate success and happiness with money. And as we classically know, you know, you can have all the happiness money can buy. Uh, 
So I, I guess I think at every you know I was I was working in a college setting, and people say, well, what are you going to major in, right? And they, you know, there's just like so many possibilities, and it's confusing and overwhelming. But to be encouraging, and to be patient, to encourage people to be patient, to find their path, and teaching might be one of those paths that people would be discouraged from because they're, the income that you get uh, as a beginning teacher is around, uh, we heard today, $42,000. And if you have $60,000 in student debt, you might think, you know, and your family might say, don't do it. You know, go someplace where you can make more money. But that's, that, hasn't, that hasn't worked either, right? Uh, we have some very unhappy, angry people in our country. Uh, and, I, and I think that um, encouraging people to follow their bliss, as Joseph Campbell once famously said, but that, that would really go a long way to changing our culture if we wanted people to be happy. I, I want to kind of echo a lot of what Justice said. You know, earlier um, last year, the Minneapolis Fed, along with our colleagues across the Federal Reserve System, launched a series on the role of structural racism and the implications on the U.S. economy. And we decided to take up that series really specifically so that we could look at topics, topics like workforce, like housing, like wealth, entrepreneurship, criminal justice, education, so that we could have a historical context to understand how we got to where we are today in terms of outcomes, and then put forward policy solutions and put forward solutions that would ultimately potentially disrupt the systemic racism that you're referencing. And so, you know, I can share from that series, the three proposals that we talked about were really trying to attack implicit bias in the classrooms and really understanding, and, and this I think gets back to a lot of what we were talking about is addressing and understanding the individual child. The second thing that, we, that was proposed was Justice Page proposed amending Minnesota's constitution to really fundamentally reshape the foundation of how we're thinking about education in our state. And then the third proposal focused on zero to five early childhood education, knowing that that kind of early intervention is so important for brain development and has long-term implications for people's outcomes. I want to go back to something that Kevin said earlier this evening that relates to curb cuts, because again, I like to talk about construction. And I really, you think about curb cuts, and we initially designed those sidewalks for like a 95% use case or a 90% use case. And then the federal government came along and said, hang on a second, you actually have to also design for disabled Americans as well. And again, we understood at that moment that that was actually beneficial to a lot of other people, not only disabled Americans. And I think when we think about an education system and we think about ultimately transforming that system is we need to stop building for the 90% use case or the 95% use case and really start addressing individuals. And so that those would be the actions that I would take. Well, thank you. Uh, in closing, on behalf of Minnesota State University Moorhead, I'd um, like to thank our speakers tonight for sharing your wisdom, passion, and in truly your heart. Um, I appreciate you. We appreciate you. You know, we applaud you uh, for the endeavor that you're on. Thank you to our audience in person, uh, virtually. Um, those that are going to view this in the future, thank you also. It's been my honor to moderate tonight. I hope everyone continues to enjoy the rest of their evening. And remember, the time is now. Thank you. Thank you.